that car just pull you up the hill. Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage. The car we're featuring tonight is uh, my Pierce Sauer. It's a 1918 Model 66, the very last Model 66 ever made. Uh, this car has the distinction of having, and even to this day, the largest engine ever put in a production vehicle. It is a 14-liter six-cylinder, which is about 825, 826 cubic inches, which is uh, pretty big. Um, you know, Pierce Sauer to me was I guess you'd call it the American Rolls Royce. I actually think it was probably a better car. I'm sure I'll get an awful lot of mail about that, but uh, you'll find out why I think that in a little bit. Um, the engine was twice the size of the uh, competing Rolls Royce and easily as smooth. Uh, these were very expensive, extremely well-made automobiles. You know, whenever you're buying a car like this, a Pierce Hour or a Packard, or even a, a Mustang or Camaro, I always like to go to the owner's groups, you know, the owner's clubs. And I like to buy cars from members, you know, uh, men or women that had a car for 15 or 20 years. And you might pay a little bit more, but you'll get something that's been, been maintained and loved because the owner kind of puts pride of ownership ahead of uh, making a profit, usually when you're in the clubs. Uh, and whether I'm buying motorcycles or anything, I always go to the club for that vehicle first and see if there's anything for sale before I look in the general interest uh, publications. Uh, the gentleman I got this car from, his name is Pat Craig, and he uh, is one of the founders of the Pierce Arrow Museum. He's been in the club for years, and uh, he had this car for quite a while. I asked him to come down and tell us about it. I've had this about three years now, and it's just a, it's just a fantastic car to drive. It has so much torque. In fact, one day I was at a stoplight, and I just forgot, and I pulled away, and I got, Seems a little sluggish. And went, oh, I'm in fourth gear. <laughs> I mean, this thing has so much torque, it'll pull away in fourth gear. So it just, so it just sort of makes me laugh. It's such a different driving experience than any modern car you could buy. The only thing I could compare it to is maybe like an electric car, like a Tesla. It could, because maybe like the clutch, you've got so much torque. It's like a steam engine. It just pushes you forward. So I asked Pat to come down and, and give us some of the history. Let's meet him. Pat Craig. Pat, good to see you, my friend. Oh, thanks for inviting me. See, you always want to buy cars from nice guys because you're going to have to go to them eventually, ask them questions. And if you, if you try to screw them on the price or anything like that, oh, they'll never speak to you again. So hey, whatever they're asking, just pay that so this way you can have a good relationship. Now, you've had this quite a while, right? I bought the car in 1997 okay. from um, uh, Frank Merrill from Oregon. Okay. And Frank had purchased it from um, H.B. Pierce, who owned a funeral parlor oh, here, sure. in, here in this area. Right, right. HP got it from um, a gentleman in San Francisco. He used to live on Green Street. We could never find him. Right. And he purchased the car from the mayor of San Francisco. Oh, okay. Sonny Rolfe. Oh, okay. That later became the uh, governor of California. Oh, so, all right. Yeah. So I would so, be like the fifth owner, huh? Yep. Yeah, that's right. And I don't think this car has ever really been restored, right? It's been no. cleaned up. Cleaned up, never restored. Yeah. I, you have done a lot of work on it, cleaning it. You know, it's interesting because these engines being so massive and have so much torque, unlike a high revving V12 or something like that, everything moves so slowly, it doesn't really wear out. No. No. It runs at about 1,800 RPM. Oh, and that's the end of the world. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. And that's back. 70 miles an hour. Yeah. yeah. It's five inch by seven inch. Yeah. That's a large engine. Yeah, it's a big motor. In fact, when they stopped production mm -hmm. of the car, they actually went on to use this motor, what, in fire engines? Uh, they used them in Pickwick stages, right. fire engines, and um, anything needed a big, high horsepower motor. Yeah, because it always makes me laugh, because they always talk about, talk about the Bugatti Royale had the largest engine ever built up to that. And that was only 12 liters. Well, it was the largest. Uh, non-production engine. Right. This is the largest production right, engine. Right, right. So that makes it nice. But this was still bigger than that. Oh, bigger it is. than the Royale. Yeah, yeah the Royale was yeah. only 12. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had four forward speeds. Um, the body is cast aluminum. Yes. They uh, figured out a way in 1905 to make slip molding, it was called. And the aluminum is about a quarter inch thick. And uh, just uh, if that was sheet metal, it just have a tinny sound. It's right. 
very strong. Yeah. This car weighs 6,250 pounds. <laughs> so I know it's a heavy it's car. It's a big one. But it just rolls down the road so oh, well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. And this is, besides being the last 66 built, the first was built, what, around 13, 14? Uh, the first 66 was 12. 12, okay. Yeah. So basically the same motor all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, three spark plugs per cylinder, right? Yes. Because yeah. the piston area is, is it's this big. So you need a plug here, a plug here, and you just need a plug. You plugs everywhere. You plugs on the everywhere. side. Yeah, on the side, just, just to, yeah. yeah. And this is uh, really unusual because this is what they call a four-seater roadster. It looks like a two-door car, but it's, it's actually got four doors, but it, they call it a, a four-door four, roadster. Four-passenger roadster. Okay, four-passenger yeah. roadster. Right. Okay. And this particular car was the one they built for the 1917 show. Right. And they... Uh, kept saying it was going to be there, going to be there, and about two weeks before they said it wasn't going to be there because of technical difficulty. Right. They put a rear-mounted spare and forgot about the trunk. Oh. So the trunk wouldn't open. Okay. Yeah. So they had to shut that down and go to side mounts. Well, these were built in Buffalo, New York, which at the time, at least around the turn of the century, was either the fifth or the eighth richest city in the United States. All the lumber barons lived there. There are some beautiful mansions up in that part of the... And I think, wasn't Thomas up there in Buffalo? Yeah, that's right. That's the Thomas right. Flyer Thomas was there. Flyers were there. Uh, yeah. You know, there was a lot of industry in mm -hmm. Buffalo. Yeah. And the beautiful mansions, and uh, it kind of, in the 60s and 70s, kind of deteriorated a little bit. Now it's coming back, and it's yeah. really a... A lovely, lovely place to be. A little chilly. Jim Sanduro. Yeah, Jim Sanduro. Yeah, he's he, got the big he, museum. He's there. got a Pierce Iron yeah. Museum yeah. up there as well. Yeah, I've, I've been to his place too. It's really. The Pierce uh, factory was 44 acres under roof. Yeah, isn't that amazing? That's 44 the 40 acres. acres. Yeah. And actually, Pierce started making what bird cages and yeah, uh, ice ice boxes. Ice boxes. That's bird right. Bird cages. Right, right. And then he went to bicycles in uh, 1894. And then their first car was 1901. And motorcycles, they did the Pierce four-cylinder. Yeah, they came four out cylinder. 1909 was a four and a single. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so. I didn't but, see one. But this was really their sort of coup de grace. It was, was, yeah. Yeah, especially this is what made this him model. famous. And this was sort of the golden age of the Pierce Arrow from about 1910 to about 1918, 1919, right? After that, That's it, right. They tried to maybe go a little broader market or something. They they downsized the motors. They yeah. didn't use a T head anymore. Right. They went to a mono block, and it just wasn't the car that they used to work. Right, right. Didn't have the torque. Let's show people what we're talking about with this engine. Okay. This is a fantastic motor. You want to flip it or? Uh, yeah, here we go. This goes flip this it way. open. This is the weirdest let, opening. Let it drop. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Just grab that. Uh, oh, here we go. Put it right. There we go. There you go. Here we are. Uh, Isn't that weird? <laughs> okay, as you can see, it's made in uh, three series of two. Uh, it's a T-head, which means um, you've got valve on each side and a cam on each side. So you could call it a twin cam if you want to get <laughs> <famous>. <laughs> If you want to get, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right. But these were twin cams down. Yeah, just wonderfully powerful motors, uh, extremely smooth. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful cars to drive. Uh, this ignition, tell us about the, we have a magneto and we have a battery and coil, correct? Yes, yes, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, you have both. Also, you have up here, that's a valve lifter, essentially. That's a compression lockout. Right, yeah. right. What so, that does is, if you had to crank it by hand. You just and, pull that and it opens yeah. an exhaust valve. Oh, exhaust, so you can kind of spin it a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, and if you can spin, uh, 14 liters. Uh, believe me, you don't want to get in a bar fight yeah. with a guy, that, a guy that can hand start this motor. It'd take you bar fight. Yeah, right yeah. Away. Forget it. And of course, tell us about the distinctive header. This was oh. a Pierce Arrow um, patent. Patent. Yeah. I mean, they were the first to really put the headlight in the fender. Most most cars appeared. Remember, they had a bar across here with a light on each side. In fact, a lot of states fender lights were illegal, weren't they? That's right. They had to have inboard headlights. This was a uh, patent by the name of Dowley, D-A-W-L-E-Y. He designed this fender headlight. And late 1913, on the 38 horsepower, it came out. In 14, it was used on all, yeah. the, all the cars, so. And Pierce Hour really was the American Rolls Royce. It was the upper crust car. 
Uh, when you look at some of the ads from the period, here, take a look at these. Let me show you some here. You see, they're all kind of these artistic, hand-drawn, very uh, patrician Aristocratic. Yeah, yeah, aristocratic looking yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just very funny. I've they got wouldn't a, sell me one. No, no, no. <laughs> you or I would. No, you, couldn't, you had to be a Vanderbilt. You had to That's be right. a yep. Rockefeller. Those are yeah. the people that had Pierce yep. arrows, and, and, and they really were some. Remember, mm -hmm. this engine is twice the size of a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. So that gives you just some mm -hmm. idea how much power is available. And, and they're, you know, it's pretty effortless to drive. You think this would be a big, heavy car, but you can pretty much do this once you're- Oh yeah, they're, they're very yeah. nice. The, the steering boxes. Steering is soft on them. Not at slow speed. No, no. Little trucky, yeah. you have to get yeah. them rolling. Yeah. And of course, massive radiator. You know, I take this thing out in 100 degree heat, I'm climbing hills. It gets warm, sure, but it certainly doesn't yeah. boil over overheat. These are such overbuilt engines. Everything was heavy. Everything was made probably 10 or 20 percent bigger than it needed to be, and, and consequently they just run forever. And of course, being a slow-moving engine, 1800 being the end of the world. I mean, when you're going down the road, you're turning 700, 800 RPM. That's yeah, so you're not generating a lot of friction, you're not generating a lot of heat, you know? So that kind of keeps the wear and tear factor down. But these were, I mean, I just like looking at extra oil cans here. Oh, our, yeah, that's great. You have one for your clutch. Right. Needs good oil. Right, And right. one for the oil, yeah. yeah. And the manual, is, and this is a real manual. In fact, I'm going to get the manual. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you what this thing is like. Hang on one second. Let me go grab the manual real quick. Here is the uh, owner's manual. And this is a real owner's manual. They tell you actually how to do stuff. <laughs> My favorite thing is look at all the lubrication points on the car. This is what you do every couple of hundred miles. Just hit all these lubrication points. See there? That shouldn't take you more than 10 or 12 hours, huh? <laughs> At least. That's why these cars were owned by the rich. So yeah. they could have somebody do the lubrication. Yeah, most of them say, have your man do this. Have your man check this on a regular basis. Uh, you had to have a man. And that's, oh, yeah. yeah that's when, uh, and that was for your car. That wasn't for other things. No. No, no. That was, no, that was that's another whole. Skip that one. That's another whole area. But the cool thing about it, it just explains every single detail about the car. I mean, transmission. I mean, everything. I mean, that's kind of the neat thing about owner's manuals now. There's that air pump. Oh, the, the air pump, that's right, yeah. yeah. They're so afraid of getting sued, mm -hmm. you know, do not drink contents of battery, you know, they have all these kind of instructions, you know. In fact, most owner's manuals mm -hmm. won't, won't even tell you the air pressure because they're afraid that the, uh, they might get something wrong, you know. Show them that one. This, that? this is quite unique. That drives yeah. off the transmission. Yeah. And um, you, you had a little handle. This drove off the transmission. You pulled it. If you had a flat tire, you had a little hose that went to the flat tire, and this would pump the tire back right. up if it would hold air. Yeah, the car has an onboard compressor. Yeah, it's nice. Because so. gas stations are few and far between. If, yeah. So you just do that and pull it, and you pump the tire up. So it, it's pretty. And this was not an inexpensive car. This, you figure the average house was about $1,200 back in the day. And These this was sold a $6, for $6,000 uh, car. 6000 yes. So you could have gotten five houses <laughs> or one That's of these. Right. Yeah. That's why they went to heads of state or right. someone with a whole lot of money, like Vanderbilt's or right, Rockefeller's. Right. But the main thing is it really rides much like a modern car. I like the fact that if you do this, the car doesn't even sink down. <laughs> you know, this is 6000 This is road-hugging weight. I mean... But the brakes are actually pretty good. You've only got rear, rear, uh, rear wheel brakes. Inside, outside. Yeah, but you have two sets of brakes mm -hmm. on each rear wheel. So it grabs yeah. it on the outside and it grabs it on the inside. So right. it's a well thought out design. Let me put this back before it falls apart. And of course, this radiator to reproduce today would cost you. Oh, 15,000 yeah. plus. Yeah, easy. Yeah, easy. plus. Easy. Yeah, Because this is a diamond core, which right. is pretty rare. Uh, but very efficient. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I guess, what is this? German silver. Yeah, it is German yeah. silver. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I put a little linseed oil on the wood. Oh, I love the wheels. You did the wheels. a great job. I yeah. like those. Yeah, they, they turned out nice. Yeah. They, they, 
They the, came out all natural like that from the factory. Right, right. They were never painted. Right. Um, what else have we got here? Well, you've got the uh, cooling vents on the hood. If it's right. a hot day, you lift these up, and then the air comes up and takes the hot air off the motor. And then you had vents here that opened as well. That's for the humans. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And then you had driving lights here. Yeah. A uh, pretty comprehensive dashboard. We'll get into the dashboard when we're driving down the road. Uh, but a really comfortable car. I mean, you had a quality clock and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, nice horn. Right. There you go. When you had two horns, you had the one in the door right yeah. there. Yeah. So that, you, you that'll had get to, you. You had your friendly horn. You get the <laughs> hell out of the way horn. <laughs> but as you can see, it's just a massive automobile. I mean... Look, I look like a tiny person standing next to this thing. That's what's really funny. They don't even know I'm on this side. Yeah, you can't yeah. even see you over there, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's your gas tank here, massive, 24 gallons, because you're only getting maybe, what, eight miles per gallon, 10 miles per gallon? Four? Four. Oh, that's what they gave. I guess it is about yeah, four. Yeah, it's yeah. about four. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, your man can fill it up. Your now. man can yeah. fill it up. That's not your problem. Yeah. Well, here was the problem. When they came out and said they were going to have this at the show, they built a double rear-mounted spare. Right. Then you couldn't get to the trunk. Right. So then they tried to go to plan B, and it was too late, yeah. so they didn't make the show. So. And this is your trunk here? Yes. Quite a nice big trunk for and there's your, uh, the when, car. When we get a flat tire, you hook it up to the pump. compressor and you pump your tire up. That's pretty cool. There's your gas gauge right here. Not the most convenient if you want to see how much fuel. Especially at four miles per gallon. You're going to be running back and looking at that thing a lot. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's uh, looking good, too. But imagine, it's 1918. In fact, I think it says in the manual about driving carefully, it said any speed over 18 miles an hour is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this thing was capable of going 70. So, when you realize in 1918, most people had probably never even ridden in an automobile, the average That's true. person. So, for somebody like this to come along yeah. and to compete against a horse and wagon, oh my God, it's, it's no contest. It's just crazy. And be comfortable and reliable. I mean, it's been about a month since I started this. And when Pat came, fired right up. Yeah, and Pat came down, it cranked, boom, and then fired. Uh, I mean, it's pretty foolproof. It has a priming system. What you do is there's no fuel pump in this car. You pressurize the gas tank, you hand pump it, and then you lock that off. It keeps pressure. Uh, and then you press the primer pump, and that shoots a little gas in mm -hmm. the carburetor. Yep. And then you crank it, and it fires. You got three spark plugs. So it, it, one of them's going to hit. It's going to fire. Yeah, yeah. So. That's, a, yeah, that's the cool thing about it. I have the top off it now because when the top's back here, it just sits like too a massive. Bit. Yeah, it's too yeah. massive. You can't see behind you. But when you drive this thing down the road, you feel like Captain Nemo in the airship, you know. <laughs> I mean, you're looking down on SUVs, and, you know. It's, it's really funny. You see like why rich that. people bought these. You can sort of look down on people. <laughs> oh, you know, you know. yeah, it's, it's really yeah. pretty cool. Pretty cool. These are all your grease points. You have to grease these. All 200 of them? Yeah, every, right. every 400 miles. <laughs> how, how convenient is that? Yeah. Well, come on, it's probably time we uh, took this thing for a ride and show people what we're talking about. Let's I'm looking forward to that. Let's do it. You All haven't right. been in this thing in a few years. No, I haven't. Yeah, It'd it. be nice. Let's do it. And here's one of my favorite features, you know. Uh, obviously, there was no air conditioning these cars were built, so what they used to do is get fresh air. You had this hook here, and you would slide this over like that, put hook, that hook in the work. door. And the air was on. And there you go, and you just scoop air as you go along. That's I mean, it. Yep. Yeah, I know. It's either high or low. Yeah. Or no. Yeah, pretty cool. So that's it. <laughs> and that's only it. on the four passenger roadsters. Right. This is the with only a suicide one. door, yeah. Oh, it's the only yeah. one they did it on. I guess yeah. that's right, yeah. And then under here, although I don't, I, I'm going to find it someday, there is a, uh, this is for a, a what, what is it? An examination lamp, you know, for a, like a flashlight on a cord. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, the one that plugs in right there. Yeah, yeah. It right. plugs in right here, and you could mm -hmm. go through and dash. But uh, we'll show you the dash as we're going down the road. We'll put a half a dozen cameramen in the back seat, and they can shoot over our shoulders. You can actually stand up and film in this car when you're going down the road. So come on, let's take it for a ride. Do our starting procedure. First thing you want to do is... Uh, 
pump up your fuel pressure. Give it a few pumps. Can you see it here? I've got about a pound and a half, two pounds of fuel pressure. Once you're running, there's a pump that'll maintain that. Retard spark. Raise the gas just a little bit. Turn on the key. Okay. Uh, hit the primer. That shoots a little shot of gasoline into the carburetor. Let's hit the starter and see if she goes. Let's raise our spark. And we're ready to go for a ride. Hop in, Pat. All right, all right. Here we go. As you can see, you got your clock here, you got speedometer, you got tripometer, uh, I mean odometer rather, tripometer, speedo here, ammeter, fuel pressure, oil pressure, and various buttons for your lights. That motor's just sloping along oh, as yeah, you just holding no RPM. I'm surprised these were four speeds when most cars were three speeds. When yeah, most... they came out with a four speed in 1909. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But actually, it used to be a selling point. This car only needs three speeds to get the job done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's funny that, you know, especially with a big torquey motor like this. <laughs> the springs and everything are 100 years old, it rides incredibly well. Oh, it does. I mean, it hasn't really lost any of its uh, tension in the springs. No, no, I mean, uh, the car doesn't list, there's no low point right, on Right, right. This is just the road it was made for, you know, these two-lane roads like this. Yep. Just run along. Actually, when they were built, there were more gravel and oil broken. Yeah. Anytime the cops wave at you, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, that's right. When you went to gone on tour of this, how many miles did you do? Three, four hundred. Three, four hundred. Yeah. yeah. I did uh, two tours in a row, seven hundred miles. Wow. Oh, this is like heaven driving this. Thing. Oh yeah, it really is. Yeah. You do feel like you're in an airship because you're so high up. <laughs> well, it's got a beautiful dash. Like you say, you're looking down at SUVs. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe this thing is, well, 99 years old. Well, actually, it's 100 it's, years old. It was it's built in 17. two months. Yeah, I mean, a couple months, it's 100 years old. and. Uh, yeah, it goes 60, 70 miles an hour and just kind of lopes along and you sit up so high, it's really a lot of fun to drive. And considering there's no power steering or anything, on the move, it's really very light. Let's, uh, let's take it on the freeway and see how it cruises, come on. So when I drove this 55 miles an hour, it just cruises yeah. along and we're going, what, 50 right now? Is the 66 your favorite model PSR, or do you like the other ones better? Oh, I like the dual valve 48 horsepower. Oh, that's they, nice too, yeah. They came out in 1919 and 20. Yeah. So. And that's a T head, right? Yeah, it's a T head. Yeah, yeah. I have um, the four passenger touring like this right. in the 48 and the 38. And that cruises at 55, no problem? Easily. Yeah. This would be in a. In an RPM horsepower, this would be close to 110 right. horsepower. Well, this must have been just about the most powerful car in America in 1918, wasn't it? Well, I don't know any other car that had the cubic inches. Right. Uh, Thomas was 700, but they had a chain drive, which was uh, more power to the rear wheels. A chain drive what? Thomas. Oh, Thomas, yeah. Thomas, yeah. 
that car just pull you up the hill. a big car. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Pat Craig and the Pierce Arrow Club. You know, without those guys, these, these cars wouldn't keep running. If you'd like to know more about Pierce Arrow, go to the Pierce Arrow website, join the club, got a great newsletter, and uh, you just learn more about these fantastic cars. Pat, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. And thanks it for coming down. Great. And, uh, it was wonderful. And being a great caretaker for this car, and I hope to hang on to it for 20 years or so before it's I pass It's in your hands now. Time, so. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>